This Restorative Justice Life is a production of Amplify RJ. Follow us on all social media platforms at Amplify RJ. Sign up for our email list and check out our website at AmplifyRJ.com to stay up to date on everything we have going on. Make sure you're subscribed to this feed on whatever platform you're listening on right now so you don't miss an episode. And finally, we'd love it if you left us a rating and review. It really helps us literally amplify this work. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the episode. Welcome to This Restorative Justice Life, the podcast that explores how the philosophy, practices, and values of restorative justice apply to our everyday lives. I'm your host, David Ryan Barcega Castro Harris, all five names for the ancestors, and I'm the founder of Amplify RJ. On this podcast, I talk with RJ practitioners, circle keepers, and others doing this work about how this way of being has impacted their lives. I first met today's guest when I noticed his Instagram account continually popping up in my feed last summer. When I saw the handle, Restoring Racial Justice, I knew I had to get connected. In addition to dropping viral truth bombs online, Jorge Santos is a restorative justice coordinator and a special education teacher in Brooklyn, New York. We cover so much in this conversation from his journey from doing criminal justice work to stepping into the classroom, the need for doing this work the right way in schools, and if you stick around to the end, we get to talk about my true passion, the NBA. We're also collaborating on an intro to racial and restorative justice workshop on Saturday, January 30 from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Pacific time. If you're still curious about the basics of this work from a racial justice lens, we'd love to have you and bring a friend. Link to sign up in the description. Enjoy our conversation. Welcome, Jorge. How you doing? Who are you? I am Jorge Santos, and I'm an educator. Who are you? I am a descendant of the people from the Dominican Republic. Who are you? I am a descendant of the people who previously inhabited the land of Quisqueya, who were known as Tainos, a descendant of the people of West Africa from the Mali and Senegal Empire, and a descendant of the country of Spain. Mm. Who are you? I am a restorative justice coordinator and a special education teacher at a middle school in Brooklyn, New York, and I also manage the Restoring Racial Justice social media platform. Mm -hmm. Who are you? I'm a husband, a son, and a brother. Who are you? I'm a lover of humanity and a seeker of life's true purpose. Mm -hmm. And finally, Jorge, who are you? I'm a big fan and lover of basketball. Hey, hopefully we get to talk about that and a bunch of the other intersections of your identity in the next few moments. But before we get into all of that, it's good to check in. So to the fullest extent of this question, how are you? I am, I am reflective. Let's put it that way. Um, I'm taking this opportunity now that we are on break from the school year. Uh, this is actually my first break. I taught summer school, so I was mm-hmm. teaching this whole time since we've gone remote. I haven't taken a break. So I'm really taking this time to just reflect and think about growth. That's where I'm at right now. And also trying to get some much needed rest because I, I am exhausted, not going to lie. But how you yeah. been? How's everything with you, man? It's been, well, a, it's been a while since we touched base. It has. But before I answer, I want to turn that back to you. How have you been resting? I just read and I sleep. I try to get as much sleep as possible and I try to read. And a lot of Netflix, actually. I'm watching a lot of Netflix. Uh, I'm watching and Disney Plus, The Mandalorian and all that stuff. <laughs> so enjoying myself a little bit. Yeah, that's great. And I think like the reason I ask is because for some people it's like, rest means like oh i'm not gonna do work i'm gonna work on my side projects right (laughs) but like you know like uh we're we're addicted to um i'm not gonna put lump you into this but like as a society uh like we're addicted to like productivity and i know that's something that i struggle with too like i took four days off um like christmas christmas eve and the weekend and like yesterday monday um you know i stopped working at like 10 at night because like there's just so much that like I'm excited about that I want to be doing and like it is still work and so like that balance is always hard for me um so trying to navigate that also trying to figure out uh the directions to 
take this work of this podcast, um, Amplifier J as a whole, um, is always present, especially since it's my full-time thing. When you work for yourself, you're, you could be working literally every moment of the day. So just like setting up those boundaries for myself. Um, Definitely. Constantly, constantly working, constantly uh, dedicating yourself to the work. I think, I think that's a, a big thing though, right? But when you find something you love, it doesn't become work in my opinion. It's like you're just enjoying that. Like I, I enjoy the idea of, of reading and just sitting down and processing what I'm learning. You know, I think like that that's a part of growth. And I think the work that we're doing specifically, we're, we're pushing our, our growth as, as human beings, to be honest. So it's like, it's kind of cool. It's still work, but it's, I think it's a little fun. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I'm going to lump the work that we're doing, quote unquote, in as restorative justice broadly. It encompasses a lot of different other things, but um, you've been doing this work for a while, probably before you even knew that restorative justice was a thing. So in your own words, how did you get started? So uh, I actually received my master's in criminology back in 2010. I, uh, that's the first time I've heard of like restorative justice, the actual the word, uh, as you and I mentioned that time we spoke, that coined term, right, of, of that restorative justice that, you, that we hear a lot now in education. I heard it in the criminology field. So for me, it was sitting down and being like, okay, well, what is this? Oh, this sounds really interesting. Like, how do you, I, you know, some of the assignments were how do you incorporate this into a prison system? How do you incorporate this into the criminal justice system? Understanding, uh, you know, Howard Zen's philosophy around harms and and how do you go about uh, as a victim of expressing yourself and, and actually getting a little bit back, right, from that that was taken away from you. So as I'm sitting there in a classroom, a 20-year-old me, uh, I was kind of just like, or 22-year-old me, actually, I was kind of like, hey, uh, this sounds like a really great thing to bring to schools. Keep in mind, I had no idea I was going to be an educator. I did not want to be a teacher. At that time, I thought being a lawyer was my true calling. And I, I'm just like, this would be amazing. This would be so great if we could put this in schools. Uh, I just feel like it would be a, such a better you know, way to, to help support students. Fast forward, here I am, a restorative justice coordinator at my school, um, still growing in, in the RJ world, still developing, still reflecting. And I think that for me, uh, it goes bigger than the coin term of restorative justice, right? It is, it is a philosophy that our ancestors lived by. It is a philosophy that even if you think back to ancient times, right? If we go to ancient Egypt and we think about some of their words of wisdom and philosophies that even the Greek philosophers took, that idea of know thyself, right? What does that mean? Know thyself and then know others, right? Know your relationship with others and with your world and your community and your surrounding. So for me, it's like sitting there and processing that is way bigger than just how do you put this into a classroom? It's like, how do you become a better human being? How do you support uh, the growth of a human, right? Because as, as educators, we're dealing with students holistically as well, right? Forget the academics. We know that exists. We know that's, that's what our job is. We're there. But we're also dealing with their mental health. We're dealing with their growth as a person. We're dealing with a lot of their traumas that they're bringing in. And I think that one of the biggest things as educators, we have to understand that trauma that they're dealing with in order to support them. And, you know, for me, the RJ philosophy is a lot bigger. It goes back to the indigenous cultures. It goes back to the African culture. Uh, you know, you've done some work on it with uh, Ubuntu, right? The Ubuntu philosophy mm -hmm. of just understanding our relationship, right? With our universal bonds and what bonds us together as human beings. Yeah. I need to think of a way to rephrase that question because like, it almost always sends people on this like whole long thing where it's like, oh, I want to jump in there. I want to jump in there. I want to jump in there. Oh, so I think th there are two places I want to go. One, I want to, we're definitely going to touch on like how you switch from like, um, you know, criminology to education, which you're doing now. But, you know, even before you were sitting in that criminology class, when you learned those words, there was something that inspired you to, you know, be a lawyer, work within that system. And I imagine it wasn't like, I'm going to be a prosecute, prosecutor no. and get all these people. Or like I'm going to be like <laughs> this, you know, whatever, what, corporate lawyer, right? What was it that brought you to that space? So it was a sense of responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I would say that I grew up in a situation where my parents were able to provide me with certain privileges that other people weren't. 
And when I sit down and I examine my privileges, right, because there are certain privileges that we have and then there's issues and then uh, um, oppressive systems that also hold us back. But when we sit down, specifically myself, when I sit down and I analyze this, I'm like, I have a responsibility to support the common person next to me. How do I uplift that person who doesn't have what I have? And I think that that's one of the issues with our society right now. We don't, we only, we're so individualistic, right? When we think about uh, white supremacy culture and that idea of in, an individual and I need, I need more or I need this and I need to get this money and I need to get this job and I, 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 we're actually hurting one another, right? Which is why we're so, as a country right now, uh, we're so divisive, right? Uh, there's nothing that really brings us together because the work that we have to do is analyzing who we are. And then what is your responsibility to someone else? And, you know, as I sat there thinking like, I'm going to be a, a lawyer that's going to, you know, support, you know, uh, individuals who are being charged with, with all these, you know, laws. And, and the cool thing about the criminal justice uh, degree was that it really investigated the social factors, right, that contribute to high crime rates. Now, when you look at social economic barriers, when you look at race, when you look at specific laws that were made specifically to um, target a specific group, when I'm sitting there learning all this, that's what was motivating me, knowing that there was a system against a, a specific group of people, right? Black people, brown people, indigenous people. How do you go about breaking that system? And, you know, I, I, want, I just want to... I was reading a book the other day called Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton, you know, the Black Panther, mm -hmm. uh, one of the Black Panther founders. And he said something that that's, you know, stands out. He says, um, and even and, and we can put this into the same platform of school, right? If we just take crimes and put it with harms. Um, I don't even like the word crime, to be honest, but I think the way he references this kind of makes sense of what crime really is. So he, he mentioned uh, many activities defined by the ruling class as criminal are the acts of poor and exploited people, desperate people who have no access to the channels of opportunity. And when you think about that idea, it's like, well, if people are committing a harm or a crime because of this, what is our responsibility, right? And there's this, uh, there's this philosophy as well that I heard uh, from the Arabic culture, which is like, you know, in our culture, the criminal shares his guilt with everyone who allowed him to commit the crime. And that's deep. Like when you really process that uh, in our culture, the criminal shares his guilt with everyone who allowed him to commit the crime. Well, in our society, in American society, there are a lot of issues as to why people commit crimes. And the underlying factor is economic. Right. We know that there are people that don't have the proper opportunities. And also we know that when, in regards to education, people have been stripped from the opportunity to gaining a proper education in this country. And that's like, for me, that's what's motivating me now. So like, that's, that's the, I'm giving you the growth, right? I'm giving you the 20, 22 year old, 20 year old George, uh, Jorge, who's like growing up and, and discovering like, whoa, what is my role? And that philosophy too, about what is my role? That's where I go back into the classroom and I, you know, I push students to think about that. What is your role in the society? What, is, what are you going to contribute? Because we all have something to contribute. And we all have something beautiful to contribute if we're allowed to. And that's, that's the problem. We, we need to start allowing people to do that. Yeah. Like, there's, there's a lot in there, too. I, I really love that piece about, you know, it is like the guilt is shared by society, right? I was just having this conversation right before this. For the listeners, I, sometimes I record podcasts back to back, but the conversation that I was having just before this was about this idea of like, how do you have restorative justice um, within a system that is doing harm, right? Where like, you know, the state, um, like, let's say, for example, like housing segregation is the cause of a lot of the problems that we have, like, um, and when you're going to charge somebody for um, selling drugs, for example, how is the state accountable for creating the economic situations right there um, for this community to be divested from uh, educational opportunities not being what they are in other communities because uh, schools being funded by property taxes, you know, the list goes on and on. So like, how, how is the state, how is the community um, 
responsible and it's not within the criminal legal system so many times i think you can point to like individual communities and say like yeah you should have done better to you know raise up that young person and like there's probably some truth to that but like it is not the fault of the community that um they were divested from right right i mean you we can't put blame on policies that ensnared people that didn't create those policies yeah i mean we 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 can think about it as simple as like um some of my ancestors did not choose to be here right (laughs) right (laughs) um and you know what do you expect us to do since you've treated us like subhuman for 400 500 years on on this continent yeah and i think that one of the biggest things is schools knowing their role right like Mm -hmm. Sometimes when I when I specifically when I wrote the the RJ article, um, a lot of people were like oh, RJ doesn't work, mm. and I and I laugh at that because RJ is a philosophy, right? Like mm-hmm. it's a, it's a way of living, but they're taking it as RJ is just an alternative method to discipline, and yeah. because they didn't see that there was any sort of punishment in the sense of the Western philosophy of students needing to feel that you know hey. Uh, you're going to be held accountable by doing something tedious, right? Or, or being removed from our community because you caused the harm. Our our schools need to build community, right? Our institutions actually need to build communities and build relationships. And the pedagogy in schools has to be centered around healing because we do have a history in this country of violence, of, like you said, segregation, of racism, of policies that are created that hinder people's ability to progress. So what we need to think about as educators is really sit down and say, how do we create curriculum? How do we create uh, pedagogy that centers around healing, that's culturally responsive, where students see themselves in that and think about individuals in their own cultures who are contributing, right? They're, what I don't like is, and I think about my own education growing up and, and just learning about you know, white people, Right. That's like white. And, and now all I do is read about my own people. Right. Mm-hmm. I sit down, I study James Baldwin, I study Jose Marti and I'm just sitting down. I'm reading all these individuals work. And I'm like, why wasn't I taught this when I was in fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade? Like I was exposed to this when I got to college and I was able to do it on my own, not because the classroom taught me either. Right. right. It was like I, I was just able to do it on my own. Now, and how many people don't have those opportunities? Exactly. Right. So now if you remove role models, if you remove leaders that are there, right, we have so many leaders. I mean, if you think about just let's not even get into the history of, you know, the African continent, right, with, with Mansa Musa and, and like so many kings and queens um, in that area. But if we were just focused from the beginning of the revolutionary period, the Haitian Revolution, right, with Toussaint Louverture, you talk about uh, the Latin American Revolution and then even past that, like specific areas, like anywhere from individuals like uh, Jose Marti, who were later on in the Cuban revolution, it's like, there are so many people of color. And I just mentioned men, there are many women, right? We have Manuela Sanz, have, there's many women out there. Um, Lolita Lebron here in the United States was a Puerto Rican advocate uh, for you know, liberating Puerto Rico. There are many individuals who our students can know about, could be taught about, from a place of liberation that would inspire them to change. Now, I know that doesn't benefit everybody, right? David, we know it's not going to, some people are like, no, well, that doesn't benefit me. Well, if we're doing the work of RJ, which is the philosophy of understanding our relationships with people, then we have to understand that we need to dismantle any forms of oppression that limit people. And that's, that's, a, that's a process that individuals have to do, right? And then we have to do as a whole community. Right. So the, the, the more that we're studying how oppression works, the more we study how oppression shows up in the classroom as educators, we become better at writing curriculum, at reaching our students that are that we say are falling behind. Right. And, and they're not falling behind. The problem is we're not we're not bringing them in. That's that's the real issue. Yeah, you're I believe you're the first person on this podcast who is an active uh, school teacher, an active uh, participant. Um, in in schools and you are someone as like a person that I've gotten to know a little bit over the last couple months who lives this way of being um 
and you have an impact on the people that you're in relationship with in your school, like the students, uh, your colleagues, even their families, right? To the extent that you get to interact with them. Um, and that is net positive, right? Um, a lot of times schools are saying like, let's bring in restorative justice to, you know, combat like the school to prison pipeline. Great, like intent, right? right? Without fully knowing what this is. Do you see a way for restorative justice to be scaled up? Because like within institutions, what I've seen so many times um, is somebody at the top makes a decision about like, hey, we're going to fund this now. And here's this other thing that we're going to do in school. And you're going to go to XYZ PD, professional development. And like, we're going to rewrite these policies. And this is how it is without having people like really value the relationships or go through that transformational mindset shift uh to to really value the relationship is restorative justice scalable in your opinion i think so um and i know that people may not want to use the term restorative justice right what it's been Mm -hmm. coined to be but the philosophies of it now if we strip away the the term and we focus only on what rj is uh that philosophy of community building and relationships right we can we can agree to that that those are the two main things and then dealing with conflict those are the areas where RJ supports growth within people. So that can be scaled up to any area. If we focus on community, whether that's in the workplace, whether that's in government, uh, whether that's in a classroom, it can be done, right? We can focus on community. We can think about um, social factors. Like if we looked at race, gender, if we looked at uh, disability status and other identities that kind of shape who we are and the way those interactions work amongst one another, right? When we think about intersectionality, I think that RJ can work, but it's it's a lot of work. And I don't think there's uh, there's not always buy-in from people because we're very quick to think, well, I, I don't I don't want to be called a racist. I'm not a racist because you know I don't go around saying these things. It's just these are the way things are, right? Like really quick to say stuff like that. And it's like, well, if you want to become a better human being, which I hope everybody does. Right. And I do believe this. I do believe that at the end of the day, no matter, uh, you know, beliefs, race, uh, you know, even economic status, we all have certain set of beliefs. Right. We want to live a a, a life with dignity. Right. And want to live a life where we can support the future generations. Right. Where we leave something to our children or our children's children or whoever's left behind for our our legacy to pass. I believe that everybody kind of wants that for the most part. So if we all want that, we can agree on those things, then we have to start weeding out all the things that make us a little different in the sense of, um, you know, systems of oppression, right? Because there's no reason why someone shouldn't, you know, receive a proper education in this country that we call uh, um, the most powerful country in, in the world, right? We, 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 schools have be, are, are still used in the same way that it was used when they first started in this country, right? To indoctrinate certain uh, values to students that glorify capitalism, right? Like the reason you go to school is to get a job, right? That's that's like, you want to go to school because you want to get a good job, which yes, that is a portion of it, especially in this capitalist system that we live. But there's a big issue when you're not giving the proper education to people because you know that that would give them more opportunity. So that's in the school sense. So we have to start as a whole, if we want to scale it up as a whole, thinking about what are barriers, what are policies that are creating barriers, dismantling those, because we all want to have a certain set of dignity in the way we're living, right? And I think that what happens is, and even in education, when you think about schooling and people prioritizing like discipline, they're they're prioritizing that because they want to maintain the status quo. And that's what's happening even when you scale it up. Our government doesn't do certain things because they want to maintain the status quo. So the conversation really has to be about how do you use education, scaling education up too, because education just doesn't happen in school, right? It happens everywhere. We learn constantly. How do you educate people to become better human beings? And I think that that's the philosophy behind RJ, and I think that's how, if we start looking at it from that lens, people will become better in the way we treat each other, in the way our relationships, and the way we go about our life as, as a whole. 
Yeah, I think a lot about what scaling up means. And like, yeah, you can you can do it th- through the relationships. And that, like you were saying, it's going to take time, right? Um, and it's not a linear process. And I think the nature of the school structures make it really difficult with people being so in and out of schools, especially in leadership in some places, right? Um, and like students naturally like progressing through school and hopefully like you're able to build those relationships on the day to day. Um, but like the adults in the building are often the ones who are really setting the culture. Right. Um, and then when adults are incentivized, um, by the structures that exist to not value relationships, it's like, how do we, how do we really make this work? Because like, I think to your point, like scaling this up, right. Means not, participating in the system as it is right and that's risky for a lot of people Mm -hmm. um and people like to be honest like don't often want to put in that work (laughs) and so like where do you find hope in uh, continuing to do this work oh that's an easy question for me man i find hope in the children i think that uh as we grow older we lose a little sense of our humanity (laughs) to be honest uh we become you know, all this all this media and propaganda changes our mindset sometimes to think like when you think about the definition of success, when you think about the definition of uh, achievement, right? Like if I was to ask somebody, hey, uh, what, what's, how do you define being successful? A majority of people will say some sort of economic, you know, monetized state of being, right? Like, well, I have this, I have a million dollars, I have a house, I have... so. Uh, my hope comes from future generations. When I sit down and I see the way students engage, I see the way students build relationships. Uh, you know, if you're a kid that's a new kid, you just transferred in and some other kids are like, hey, let me show you around, right? Like that, that right there, that, that decency to be like, hey, let me, let me just show you around, man. You're a new kid here. Um, we have to get back to that root. And that root is love, right? Love and respect. When we get back to those roots of why we are human beings in the first place, what separates us from other beings, right? Other animals. It's the fact that we're conscious, we can love, right? So when I see young kids growing up, being in the classrooms with them, having conversations with them, that's what gives me hope. And I see them build communities. I've, I've been a part, I'm, a, I'm a, also a basketball coach and a volleyball coach. And just being a part of those like moments, man, like to be, I, I tell my wife all the time, I'm like, look, I have more fun when these kids win a game than like in the classroom when, you know, they're just like bored, you know, and sometimes I'm like, oh, come on, like, and I try to motivate them, but there's nothing like seeing kids work so hard, whether that's in the classroom or on the, on the team, but when they dedicate themselves and work so hard and they, they achieve it, right, that, that moment of like happiness, that's what, that's what motivates me. And I think that that's super important when schools are creating those areas of community around um, clubs and sports and making connections. Right now, uh, our school is in the second year of affinity groups, right, by race and being able to just share something about your culture and, and then being able to also talk about challenges that we're facing and how do we bring that up to the entire community. So there are many frameworks that our schools can do to incorporate RJ from, you know, holding discussions, from sharing experiences and students' experiences and stories, narratives are beyond important. If you're a teacher right now and you haven't spoken to your students about just their life, like anything, then that's what you need to do. If you want to do some of this RJ work, sit down, ask a kid, hey, how's it going? What do you like to do? I had a kid the other day telling me about skateboarding and he's like, yo, Jorge, I was, I was on the skateboard and I was like, you know, I was riding on cars and I said, maybe you shouldn't do that. That sounds a little scary to me, but I appreciate you telling the story. I mean, I'm a little older, so I'm a little, you know, I'm a little wiser. Please don't do that with the stuff. But I think it's super dope that you're skateboarding, man. Like I don't skateboard. I've never done that in my life. I was a basketball player, but yo, that's, that's really dope. Right. And, but the fact that he shared that and guess what he did right after he told me that story. What did you do when you were my age? And that's, that's that relationship building, which sometimes we as adults forget to do, right? When we're just having a, a conversation with somebody, sometimes we may forget, hey, tell me your story. Like if you, if you just, David, if you just go around and you start telling people, excuse me, can you just tell me your story? You're going to get amazing stories, man. Everybody has a story to tell. Everybody could write a book because we all, we all have our own shoes. No one could walk in our shoes. And I think that, <laughs> so- yeah. It, it, so I'm laughing because 
my first foray into uh, doing things on Instagram outside of like my own like oh I'm posting about myself um, I started this project a uh, photography project I'm not a photographer but uh, it was called views from my shoes you can still look it up it's there uh, it only has like 300 followers it's not important it's not about the numbers but what I was doing I was walking around um, Chicago where I was living at the time asking people like one if I can take a picture of your shoes but um, tell me like what would I learn if I lived today in your shoes right so like the view from my shoes right and like it was really cool I think like part of it is because like being like the restorative quote unquote restorative justice practitioner that I am like I know how to like approach someone in a way that's gonna make them feel like safe and like feel held in that space and like open share like of course not everybody does right but uh you approach the person in the right way and like the the stories of people who's like um you know have left their families because of you know whatever going on people dealing with mental health people dealing with um or, like, or people being, like, really excited about, like, the basketball game they just played or, like, picking up their kid or, like, the struggle of, like, working night shift so uh, they don't get to be as connected with friends. Like, it's it's really just sitting there and people don't get asked. Um, you're right. Like, I don't know why that – I mean, I know why that came up, but, like, I haven't thought about that in a while. That was wild. It's, it's really – it can be that simple. And, and, and those stories are powerful, right? They make you a better human being. Right. From hearing someone else's experiences. And then you can also contribute. And, and as RJ coordinator, right, when I'm facilitating these circles, it's stories. Sometimes they're conflicts, but the conflicts are stories in themselves. Right. The gossip and all this and who had problems with who. But one of the most powerful things that I do is that I also uh, I'm also vulnerable myself. So when I'm hearing them speak on something that they're ashamed of or that they're upset that they did or, or a conflict, I share my personal stories as well as the facilitator of that circle because I want them to see me as human, not the teacher, not the not the teacher who's standing up there that they may see, oh, yeah, you can't relate. You're a teacher. What do you know? Right. You've never been in my seat. Ironically, we all have. But kids don't think like that. So when they see now, oh, I get it. He went through the same thing I did. I'm going to be OK. Right. And that's when that whole dialogue of RJ is super important. And I feel like sometimes when people think RJ, they, they automatically want to see, you know, quick results. Right. Because we live in a world of information. We want quick results. We want to look at the data. And the, it's a commitment. And I'll say this right now. It is a commitment. And it's not something that you're just going to have a conversation with one kid today and it's going to be better tomorrow. You're dealing with, with students that have a lot of trauma. Right. And, and when you think about students of color, specifically boys and girls uh, and, and transgenders as well, when you think about these individuals, they there are so many traumas, so much personal stories that they go through. Right. That it's like, well, how do you support them? It's not going to happen overnight. You have to hear their stories. You have to engage in conversations with them. You have to provide a safe space for them to feel empowered. And that's where, like, you know, we, we, can, we can talk about the, the tiers of, you know, RJ tier one, tier two, tier three. But when you, when you talk about the most important tier of building community, every student in that school needs to feel like they are a part of that community. Whether that's because they did well on their project, whether that's because they scored the winning volleyball point, whether that's because they have a club that they go to, whether that's the affinity group or the BSU, the Black Student Union, right? There needs to be a space where they feel seen, where they feel heard. And I think that the more schools are providing that, students are finding out who they are. I, I had told the student one time that, uh, I forget what they did, but kid stuff, right? <laughs> and I told them, look, school is a simulation. School is not real life. This is... You're here to learn how to be in the world. Now, if that's true, what I'm saying, we can think how ed education has failed, right? If we think about society as a whole in regards to, you know, if we look at it from the lens of what media tells us, I think there's a lot of good people. I think that that doesn't get promoted enough. And I think there's amazing work. But if we want to continue that side of it and we want to see it more, then education does play a role in that. And if school is a simulation of how we're supposed to be, what happens when schools are the oppressors, 
that's scary, right? Because then schools are telling you this is your role, this is your place in society. And if you look at the numbers of you know, mass incarceration, and you, feel, and you look at three to one black males, uh, six to one Latino males, that's school to prison pipeline is sending that message. So we need to transform education completely to allow our students to make mistakes, to allow students to just be like, yep, I messed up. Let's talk about this. Why did you do this? Allow for that space to reflect, allow for that space to grow. Is it going to change tomorrow? No. But this is where they're supposed to learn. Why create trauma? More trauma than that we're already going through. And, you know, if you look at the experiences of, of marginalized people, then you'll understand why there are so many um, barriers for us to, to kind of like fight through. I mean, growing up, the, the main thing our parents tell us, right? You got to work 10 times harder. You got to work 10. Like that's a common thing told to people of color. You got to work 10 times harder than someone else. Why is that? Because we have barriers that we need to, you know, jump over. And that's you know, not like, fair. You know, it's well, not fair to us. There's also like, and I know this isn't like universally true and it's also true for some white people, right? But like, People of color here in the United States generally have this um, this sense of responsibility to take care of community as well, whether that is your family or other people who are experiencing the same things you are. It's not like, oh, like I've gotten to, you know, X achievement and like I'm good. Just like, no, I've got to go back and get uh, my other people and and help them get to where I am, so we can we can all thrive. It's not just about like individuals individuals achieving and i think that's one of the reasons that oh, i'm just thinking of like all the different directions this conversation can go but like one of the reasons that we connected um is because we are i think between the two of us uh we are the largest instagram accounts explicitly talking about like rate uh sorry restorative justice if you search if you didn't follow either of us before if you search restorative justice like uh both your account uh restoring racial justice and my account, Amplifier IJ, would come up. How did you decide to start to um, start posting on Instagram about racial and restorative justice? And that, that was just this summer. Yeah, um, well, it was everything that was happening, right? From uh, the racial tension in this nation that's continued for many, many years. And then uh, the pandemic and just being home without any kind of um, real human connection, right? Being... <laughs> removed from being able to engage in discourse with people. So I, I felt like I needed an outlet. I felt like I needed a space where I could share what, what, what was, were some of my thoughts, share some of the thoughts that I see from other people. And um, it's it's been amazing to see the reception. It's the growth of it as well. Um, it's motivating, like just to be able to see what um, what other educators are doing as well. Like a lot of people send me some stuff and I'm just like, wow, it's so dope. Like it's so cool. And People will hit me up and be like, hey, I'm, I'm having this issue. What would you do? And, you know, I, I try to help people out as much as I can. I, 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 it's difficult because, you know, we're all ourselves and we have the way we handle situations. I can't speak for what other people are going through. But just the fact that they feel OK to share their stories with me about their struggles, I appreciate that. And if I can support, I, I'll support. Uh, but it was just a, a place of feeling like I had to um, contribute. I had to contribute to. Um, a better a better future for the next generation, right? And, and like I said, I, I studied all the, the people that have put out amazing work and that, you know, you look at, like I'll reference James Baldwin, Jose Marti, and, and you think about a lot of writers and, you know, we could go to Malcolm X, you know, Martin Luther King. When you think about the things that they put out, it's like it still lives today. Right. Like it, it's kind of amazing. Some some things you can read and it's still like, wow. Like when I was reading uh, Huey P. Newman's book, Revolutionary Suicide, the other day, I'm like, man, this is from the 1970s. Why is this sound like he's speaking to me today? And I also feel like. That that idea of speaking to me, right, mm -hmm. the ancestors, as we're reading people that are uh, I'm reading people that are no longer here. And then it's like that. That's it. Those are the ancestors speaking to us. To, to motivate us to think about like, hey, we're still fighting this struggle. What are you doing? Right? Yeah. What do you what what is the you know, if, if you think about it, it's a long road to liberation. They've all put a piece down on that road, right? They all they're 
putting that pavement down. What are we doing? What's our generation doing? And I think that right now, this is the civil rights movement of our time. And I think that one person is not going to dismantle a system. It is a community. So we all have to think about like, what is my role? And when I sat down and I was reflecting on that, like, what is my role? I was like, you know, I'm, I'm, let me just, social media is like the thing right now. We can't even go out, right? So it was like, yeah. let me jump on this. Um, and also using my experiences in the classroom, talking about the work that, that I was doing, I felt like I had to get that out to people to hopefully inspire them to start changing the way they look at schools and look at disciplinary methods because a lot of people are really quick to be like, but you know, like th these kids, they just, they just don't want to learn. And that's a dangerous mindset if you're an educator. And I've seen it. They post it on the, uh, on the account all the time whenever I post things, right? And it's, it's frustrating because I, I, sit, I sit and I read that and I'm just like, man, there's a kid in that class that would benefit from having someone who actually believed in them. Right. You know? Or ask them, like, how's it going? Right? Not right. like, why didn't you do this assignment, like, the right way? So yeah. many things. I, I think one of the things that I imagine is, is tough for you is, like, balancing um, the work that you're doing, um, engaging people on the internet with like the work that you're doing as a teacher and like a restorative justice coordinator uh, during the day in the middle of a pandemic. What has that, well, I think, what is your role as a teacher and a restorative justice coordinator look like? And then how do you balance the, the three? Yeah, so as a, as a teacher, I am a, I'm a special education teacher. So I, I work with students uh, with certain learning disabilities, which, you know, that entails the, the writing the IEPs, uh, differentiating lessons and modifying um, some of their work and supporting them in small group one to one especially right now with the um, we're in remote learning in, in my uh, New York so with that right now it's it's, it's virtual supporting the students which is it's, it's hard because kids don't even have their screens on and some of them don't like to talk but you just keep on and you keep motivating them you find ways to inspire them so that that's the teacher role and then in the classroom when we are there um, Right now, because of the way it is, I have a smaller group of like 10 students that I'm just teaching every subject, right? Like I've just taken it upon myself and many educators at my school to just teach every subject just to make sure that they're, they're learning, that they're motivated, that they feel important and that they, that, um, they feel like this year is still relevant to them. In, in a regular world, right, um, I would be in the, in the ICT room, which is the integrated co-teaching. So two teachers in a room supporting each other, bouncing back off each other and, um, you know, just supporting a, a ICT class, which has students with certain learning disabilities and general ed students as well. Um, and then restorative justice coordinator um, that, that, that has many hats as well, because that involves building the sense of community in the school, thinking about the direction of how community is going to look at the school from affinity groups to sports teams uh, to um, just like special kind of events like, you know, the staff versus teacher kind of uh, activities and stuff like that that kids love and think and advocating for like elective classes where students can pick an elective voice, what elective they want to have at their school and then pick one to join. So that's that's one hat. Then definitely the conversations, right? Conversations with students, working with students that um, are struggling to to be a part of the community and trying to give them a place to to blend in. Like where, for example, I had one student who had a really traumatic experience in uh, his whole school experience has been traumatic coming in from elementary school, hate school, you know, the whole like, I, I don't trust anybody. I hate everybody. I hate school. I don't, this is boring. This is boring. This is boring. I hear that like all the time. Um, I don't give up on him, though. I don't give up on him. I work with him. Uh, when he was having a lot of trouble, he told me he liked volleyball and we had a girls volleyball team. And I told him, yo, you know what? Like, just come to practice. You can join the team, like be the manager. You can't play in games because of the rules of, you know, the, the DOE. But like, just be a part of the team. And you could see the transformation, right, of just him feeling like he was a part of something. And the conversation has become a little trustworthy. You know, he knew that, all right, like he let me on this team. He wasn't supposed to. You start building that trust. That, that, and, and then there's also the training teachers, right? Uh, how do you develop your staff to be aware of a lot of the uh, privileges and how that shows up in the classroom and allowing um, 
for growth and also trainings to train um, educators how to have these de-escalating conversations, right? Because sometimes in education, um, you can choose to to take a student to another level, right? If a student gives you attitude because they're having a rough day, you can give them attitude right back. And then the kid's going to get even more frustrated. You send them out of your class, you remove them from the community. Or you can allow the student to have that moment, let them kind of calm down, come back and be like, hey, what's going on? Is everything okay? That makes a big difference, David. Like that, just de-escalating that situation where it's like, okay, this kid's having a bad day. Just walk away. Let me come back and check in. Next thing you know, you find out something happened at home. They're hungry. Um, they're not understanding the work and they're frustrated and they took it out on you. But if you're quick as an educator, and don't get me wrong, we're human. We have our bad days. And whenever I've had my bad days, I specifically tell my students, I want to apologize for what happened yesterday. I acted out this way. Let me actually share why. I'm going through this. I had a family member that something happened to them. They were arrested. And, I, and I've legit told them this. Like, this is me sitting down in a circle with my students that I, you know, was frustrated um, and I told him, I had, you know, a cousin of mine was arrested and, you know, I'm just, it's on my mind and, and I was angry and upset and I kind of just didn't, my, I had an attitude yesterday. It allows them to see me as human, but I also see them as human. And I think that's important that educators, we can no longer have this like authority figure. I'm better than you. I am the, the, the gatekeeper of knowledge and you have to respect me because I am better than you. I have a college degree. Can we just see them as human and they see us as human? And we're all working together in unison. That's the ideal goal. And I think that as educators think about that, process that, they'll become better um, educators and, and better RJ advocates in, in reality. Yeah. Um, again, so many things in there. Uh, what does that look like in pandemic life? Yeah, in the pandemic, it's creating digital spaces of community. That's really what it is. Um, being able to uh, just have fun with the kids. I, I did a scavenger hunt with my small group. It was called like an advisory or a crew. So we did like a house scavenger hunt and we just like, you know, got, finally got them to turn on their screens because they don't like to turn on the screens. But I was like, you need to show proof that, you know, you, you grab that book or, you know, your cell phone, you're showing it. Um, so th it's, it's about creating digital spaces like affinity groups where we all meet and we have conversations about our identity. And uh, right now uh, I'm, I'm leading the Latinx uh, group and it's really about understanding uh, anti-blackness in the Latino community and also understanding the the history the dynamics of like why do you have white passing Latinos and why do you have dark-skinned Latinos and you know because they're in middle school so allowing them to kind of reflect on that um, in a digital space and then just learning learning overall just trying to uh, create lessons that um, really put them at the center. I think one of the most important things that as educators we can do is present students with problems that are relevant. Um, right before the, the COVID pandemic hit, uh, we were talking to them about it and they made videos about like, what do you think will happen <laughs> with this pandemic? Nobody knew <laughs> that this would <laughs> be the case uh, a year later, but it allows students to sit back. And one of the things that I'll never forget, a student um, told me while they were working on their projects about like, is COVID serious or not? Or is like, is the flu more serious? And just having those conversations, the student said, I'll never forget it. She said, I do wonder what's going to happen when COVID hits um, third world countries that don't have the infrastructures that we have in America in terms of like hospitals. And I was like, wow, that's deep. Like this is, this is her thinking about this back in late January, early February. This is before everything even went down. I wasn't even thinking about that. We was kind of just like, oh, I don't know what's going on. It's kind of crazy. But and that's what like if you can get students to think like that, man, if we if we would have thought like that, maybe we could have prevented a lot of things that were going on. Because little did we know that the infrastructures in our own country, our first world country. Uh, yeah, well, we don't have to say to see some of the, CNN, infra but. some of the infrastructure was there, just wasn't used. We don't need to go. Into all you don't need of to get into that. All. Yeah, that, that's a whole episode. Yeah, uh, I'm curious. Like within your role as uh, RJ coordinator, what is look like? What does supporting staff look like? Yeah, so supporting staff is bringing them in when uh, things are, you know, said that uh, could be perceived as something. Sorry, that is, sorry right? specifically in pandemic life. Oh, in the pandemic, like oh, they're a part. They're a part of it. A part of the affinity groups, um, leading the affinity groups, leading these uh, conversations. 
um, building community in any way they can. Right now, um, they actually put together like uh, a really cool like uh, holiday spectacular. Uh, some some uh, educators are so creative. They have like puppets and they teach the class through the puppet. And it's it's just fun ways to keep kids engaged. Um, kind of just remind the, you know us that we have to have fun in these times. So I think that allowing that space for creativity and, and advocating for teachers to be creative, to think outside the box, to think away from the frameworks of the norm, because the norm doesn't work for us. Right. And 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 that's something that we have to keep like talking about, like, yo, you know what, like this is not going to work. Um, like and, and I was in March when we went full remote, I specifically was saying if it didn't work in brick and mortar. If kids were not struggling, if kids of color were struggling with this in the building, this is our opportunity to finally change it and reflect. Why are we continuing to do the same thing remote where there's more barriers? That's the scary part, right? That's the scary part. So I think that we, as, as an RJ coordinator, is just continuously pushing your staff, continuously pushing your administration, pushing yourself, right, myself, um, to think about what is the true goal of education? You know, um, I saw something the other day that said, you can be rich and still be uh, poor in etiquette. You could be rich and still be, you know, rude. You could be rich and still have a low education, even if you have a degree. Well, why is that? That's because we don't know how to treat other people correctly. We don't know how to treat people with respect. We don't know how to treat people with dignity. Uh, with some some amount of decency. And for me, that's where education comes in, whether that's in school or out school, because we're constantly learning. Education has to be tied around that idea of bettering ourselves. Going back to the Egyptian philosophy, right? Know thyself. Because the minute you know yourself, then you understand your role. And if COVID taught us one thing, not to go into COVID, but if COVID taught us one thing is that everyone's role is important. Because if you think about the essential workers, which the majority of them were predominantly people of color, they were the ones that were delivering food. They were the ones that were cooking meals. They were the ones that were cleaning the hospitals, right? And we see that because of the, the amount of rates of people that have contracted it. If you look at um, indigenous, black, and Latino right now, they're at four times higher rate uh, from the last time I looked it up that are contracting it and also passing away from it. It's because we're being exploited still. So if we're going to talk about education, we need to think about how are we no longer exploiting people, which means that education can no longer just hone kids to be a part of a, a system, right? A capitalist system that just shoots you out. And it's like, well, you couldn't survive in school, so you're probably not going to survive in society. Goodbye, because everyone has a role. And if that role means that you're going to deliver, uh, you know, food from a restaurant, then guess what? That role matters. It's important because someone was calling to get their food and that person had to do it. So I think that we need to stop. Um, when we reflect on, you know, success, we need to reflect on what is success? In my opinion, it is to be a decent person. It is to be a good person and do everything with passion and do everything with purpose. If I'm going to deliver um, if I'm a delivery person, I want to be delivering food to you, then I'm going to do it the best and the m most courteous way. And that person has dignity and respect, at least in my book. Now, I know people will argue, oh, money, money, money doesn't bring happiness. And we, we could talk about that for hours, how it doesn't bring happiness, because first off, you would have Jeff Bezos not trying to become the first trillionaire because he's not satisfied. So then we need to sit down and think about, like, what is it to be truly satisfied in this world? And until we sit down with ourselves and, and, and find that out, we're always going to be trying to more and more and more and more and more the whole idea of greed and, and American you know, capitalism. But education can kind of put a stop to that where students can become a little more reflective, can become a little more passionate about what they're doing. And that's why I'm so big on the sports, because for them, it's something that they're really like, man, you know, like I, I want to be successful at it. Right. And it's like or, or it could be a club, too. There's like other clubs that um like I was in the finance club and it was the finance club was really cool. Like I had them learn about stock markets and how to purchase a house. I put them through like little simulations and, you know, cause financial literacy is important. Right. And we need that in our communities. And they, they're so passionate about just being able to, to just, you know, 
attain a certain level of like, I worked hard and I got to this point. So if we can allow them to be like, hey, there's a problem in our society. What work can you do to make that better? Man, they'll feel so empowered. They will feel amazing. Better than a grade. Better than a grade. You could give them an A. The A is nice. But for them to be able to tell you, hey, uh, there was an issue in my town. We had a, a, you know, a, a certain, uh, certain water pipes in my town that were you know, old and rusted and they were you know, getting into the school communities and to our parks. And we went and we, we, we advocated the city to change it. And now we have new pipes and we have clean water. Like, that's a story that a kid can tell. Why aren't we putting kids in position to do that? We can, right? It, we can, and, and that will just allow them when they get to college, when they become adults, to understand their responsibility to society. And that goes back to the ideas of James Baldwin, right? Of allowing students to examine their place in society and being like, okay, what's my role here? Now, if, if educators are not putting kids like that in, in those situations, then you are just continuing the status quo of normalizing a white supremacy culture. And I know people are like, oh, but, but it's the system that we work in. I get it. But if you are truly about changing, then you need to understand the barriers that you are going against. And there are a bunch of systems that are working to maintain that status quo. And if you are okay with normalizing you know, disciplines that impact students of color, then you're okay with white supremacy. And I'll just call it what it is, man. I said I said a lot, yeah. but it's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think one of the one of the major threads in there is like you know this work is not about not mostly. I would say it's not mostly about discipline, right? It's about how you are in relationship with others, and you said that in so many ways. But I think first, like the relationship with yourself, right? How are you helping young people develop that well? How are you developing that for yourself? What are the values that you hold that will allow you to continue to keep, uh, well, either like keep things the status quo or like take some risks to make some changes? Like it, like you were saying at the beginning, this work isn't easy, uh, but it's so necessary. Um, we got off. Uh, like, I, I really did want to come back to this because like we started talking about like how you started like, oh, I'm going to be a lawyer um, and you were getting your master's in criminology. How did you make the shift to decide like, you know, education was the place for me? Oh, yeah. So when I was working at a law firm, uh, just I graduated from the first master's degree, um, the criminology one. I, I was working at, at a law firm and I was so unhappy. It would, everything was money. Everything was money, money, money. And I was just like, man, like, I don't feel like I am contributing. I feel like the lawyers were just taking advantage of people. And I just felt like I wasn't doing anything for my community. And I, I was unhappy, right? And I, I kind of just like fell into like this somewhat of a depression where I didn't really want to talk to coworkers. I didn't really want to speak to anybody. I would just show up to work, do my job, leave, very little conversation. People started complaining about me. At the workplace, they said, you know, I wasn't a good fit. The lawyers let me go. Um, when the lawyers let me go, I shook their hands. I said, thank you, because it was liberating for me. I just didn't want to be there. But I sometimes have this thing where I don't like to quit in, in life. Mm -hmm. I like to do things until the point where I guess I can't do it anymore, right? So then I'm like on, uh, I'm on the train going home, and I saw an ad that said, uh, become a New York City teacher. And I, took, I legit took that as a sign. It was a sign, literally, but I took it, I took it as a sign. And I had a, a mentor who, uh, he is a teacher. He's been a teacher for about 13 years now. Um, he's like a mentor just growing up. He was actually my high school teacher and we're still friends. And he always used to tell me like, man, you need to get into the classroom. Like that's your true calling. And I think that sometimes we have to acknowledge when, when it, it, our calling is calling us. And it's that whole idea that uh, we, don't, we don't get to pick dreams, dreams pick us. And I think I believe that. And I, and I think that that was my dream. My dream chose me to be an educator, to inspire children, to put them on a path of finding their inner success, whatever that is to them. And I think that was the, the moment for me, man. It was, that, it was that sign on the train, man. Shout out to the sign on the trains. You never know who you're inspiring or, or whose life you're changing. Yeah, absolutely. And so you, you did the schooling needed to do that. Um, you decided that like special ed was a place to focus and then like restorative justice along with that. How did 
those two things intersect for you? Yes. So um, when I sign up for the program, it's like the New York City Teaching Fellows Program. Um, you know, you, you go through uh, the training of becoming a teacher. You get placed in the classroom. You're, you're doing your second. Uh, well, for me, it was my second master's for education. Uh, place as a they they placed me as a special ed, which I was also looking forward to because I I knew the um, students that I was working with um, needed the extra support, so I was excited about that. And you know, teaching for about three years, uh, two years in the classroom, we my school did have a RJ coordinator that was doing um, some amazing things, but I, I definitely felt like there needed to be more support, um, and, and also I felt like there needed to be a, a an RJ coordinator of color as well too, right? Someone. Who Talk can, about it. Uh, yeah, someone who can actually like, uh, who understands and is part of the culture, right? Because it, I, I think it's difficult. I mean, a lot of people could do RJ work, and it's definitely something that's you know anyone can do, right? But when you are building relationships, it is definitely easier to um, build it with someone who has some kind of you know uh, relevance, right? Like you just know what they're going through. You kind of went through it. You understand the the identity crisis sometimes that they're going through. So um, there was there were certain opportunities that presented itself where the RJ Cornader, um, who was an amazing dude, um, he wanted me to jump on board and we, we got to work, man. And it's, it's been a great relationship with him and I just uh, growing the, the program at our school. Like, uh, you know, obviously from peer mediations to fairness committees to just empowering students as leaders to have that discussion. I mean, it's amazing to see when a student commits a harm in the uh, in the school community, and then you invite stakeholders, which are students and adults, right, mm -hmm. who may have been impacted by that um, that act, and you sit down and you allow these students to just have a conversation, and the students are saying, "Why did you do this? What did you think would be would happen? What's going on? Like, why would you do this?" And it's super powerful. For me not to say a word sometimes, to just sit there and see middle school kids um, allowing another student to understand what they did was wrong, that they were harmed by it. What is going on? What is, we, what is the root cause of, the, of why you did this? Right. Not placing blame, not placing blame, not the traditional you, you, were, you know, you, you messed up. You, you know, what you did was wrong. It's like coming from a place of love. And that's why I feel like sometimes students are better at being humans, right? Because they still have that, that, that love in them, um, that, that childhood um, aspect of loving and, and believing, right? They believe in, in other people and believe in a lot of things, right? Because of their imagination. But I've seen it where a student who you know, did something, I don't want to say what they did, but let's say they did something that really hurt the community in tears, crying, not because they're being told that you know they messed up or this but because they feel that they did wrong when they hear the impact that they have mm -hmm. and then genuinely being like i'm going to make this right because now they see but also understanding that they're going to have support for whatever they're going through and that's that's the rj work that's why when people are like it doesn't work it's like yeah it doesn't work because you're not putting in the work because it's not a just do a circle, let's talk about it, and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, let's walk out of here. Yay, we're all happy out the door. No, there's a lot of follow-up conversations. There's a lot of check-ins. There's a lot of bringing families in. There's a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, which people don't see, right? That happens in the office sometimes. So that, that's a lot of the work that um, sometimes people are missing out. Right. It's not about, like, will it work? Like, what you said it's not about will it work it's will you do the work but it's also not about like how can we put things back to the way that they were it's how do we make things right right how do we get to wholeness how do we get to healing and that is never and i don't use words like never or always uh very often but like that is okay i'll say almost never like an overnight process right it's, it's the relationship right so like are you willing to put in the work for the relationship that you have with that person for that community um that was so beautifully said i kind of just want to like mic drop we're done but there's still so many more <laughs> things to talk about <laughs> let's keep it going let's keep it going um uh, how uh, like what has been like an oh shit moment for you in doing this work and what did you learn from it yeah um man an oh shit moment i think for me 
it's when a student who's struggling finally begins to trust me, right? When they can come to my office and kind of just talk about their day and you know that they were going through so much issues to, for you to gain that trust. And to finally be there and allow that student to be like, hey, what's up, what's going on? You're like, hey, what up, you know, this, that, and the third. That's that, oh shit moment. Like, oh man, like I finally gained the student's trust. Now I can, you know, continue to support them from their journey. Because a lot of people, you know, a lot of educators, and this is that, that savior complex, white savior complex, think that our students need saving. And I tell people, I'm no superhero. I'm not here to save anybody. What I'm here is to allow students to understand who they are, understand their role, and they're going to go out and do amazing things. I'm not, I'm not here to save anyone. My, my role as an RJ coordinator is to be able to present them with those opportunities, right? Allow them to examine who they are and what's their role and, and give their identity significance, right? Their identity is important. Whoever they are, whoever they're coming as, um, building them up to understand like, yeah, you know, cause you know, and it's like, it's a funny thing. Cause growing up as a kid, uh, and I'll be the first one. I would jump in conversations with adults and be told, man, be quiet. Like grown people are talking, right? How many times that happens, David, all the time, right? Grown people are talking and it's like, nah, allow your kids to speak because what's happening is that, that, um, that idea of telling kids, you know, just be quiet, grown people are talking. As they get older, they become silent, they become complacent. And we don't want our students to do that. We want our students to be vocal, even when it challenges our beliefs. And trust me, that's, that's where a lot of conflicts happen, right? Because educators will be the first ones, yeah, speak your mind, speak your mind. But then the minute a student challenges your belief, you become angry at them. And, you know, you take them out of the classroom. It's okay for students to challenge your beliefs because that's what you're teaching them. And reflect on what you did. Maybe you did something. Try to understand what perspective they're coming from. Perspective is super important. And, that, and that's something that I think we all need to work on, understanding perspective. And until we sit down and understand, like, what is the perspective of our students? How do they feel sitting in that seat? How do they look at me? Right. How do they see me through their eyes? Not how I see myself. Right. Because I want to see myself as, you know, I'm great. Hey, what's up? Yeah. No, maybe they don't see you that way. Try to understand that. And I think that that's when um, I've had those moments for me where it's like building that, those, those trust factors and allowing them to even challenge me and allowing them to speak, man. That, that's huge. That's huge for a kid to, to speak up whenever they see anything that's, that's unjust. For sure. I'm laughing because like you took the question the opposite direction of which I thought is like, I should have said like, oh shit. Like I should have like put in that like intonation, like what's a moment that you, like and the way that you answered it was beautiful because like, ah oh, shit, yeah. But like, what's a moment that you like made a mistake and what did you learn from it? Oh, a mistake. Oh man, please. Mistakes. I mean, um, I think rolling out, um, just like rolling out certain um, RJ conversations, man. Like when we first tried to launch that fairness committee, um, you know, just not like that silence. Sometimes it would be silent where kids didn't know what to say. So it was like, oh man, like we messed up. How did we train them? And then sitting with kids and, uh, you know, having conversations with the kids that were stakeholders about like, first off, um, decolonizing their minds of like, what is punishment? Like thinking about that. That was a huge thing because you automatically think that a student is thinking like you're thinking, right? Because you've done this work and you're kind of like, yeah, yeah, they're, they're on this path. Meanwhile, they're thinking just like adults. They're thinking just like society sometimes. So it's like you definitely have to sit down and have a little conversation about like we don't want to be punitive. We don't want to um, cause more trauma, right? So, yeah, there was, there was a few instances where that wasn't taken into consideration and you're kind of like, oh, shit, you know? So it definitely happens. Yeah, but you learn. I, you learn a lot. <laughs> yeah, that idea of again, like perspective taking. Just to call back to your last answer, like um, maybe they're thinking the way that you're thinking, but like don't assume that. You know, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, we've all been indoctrinated um, into like a white supremacist, punitive, carceral mindset, and you know we're doing a lot of work with Amplify RJ to start to like you know, and and you're doing it too with uh, restoring racial justice to like put it out there where people's attention is like social media is where people's attention is like, let's put content out there that is going to maybe yeah. trigger people to think a little bit differently. Uh, for me, it's just like, you know, 
if you're going to be on your phone, like you might as well learn something. And I know you've taken, uh, taken that really to heart. Um, uh, we, we, we've talked about this off offline, but what do you hope to do uh, with the Restoring Racial Justice platform? Yeah, I'm, I'm still developing that idea of like, what's the next step for um, the platform? Uh, personally, I definitely want to continue writing, continue um, producing literature, whether that be articles for, for educators to, to process and reflect on. Um, definitely uh, in, the, in, the, in the future, maybe publishing some children's books and then publishing some books around RJ and, and how that looks like in the classroom, the, the more experience I get um, through this journey of RJ. And, uh, you know, just anywhere I could support in terms of, you know, consulting schools or um, educators in, in their growth of this, you know, um, decolonizing the classroom and just incorporating curriculum and incorporating RJ. Like, I definitely want to um, go down that route. I think my, my goal as an individual um, is to definitely get into a position where I can think about um, structures and policies that can change to support um, areas of growth for RJ and seeing that live in, in different areas of schools. And, I, you know, I'm still still in my early 30s, so I think I have time to continue growing. But in regards to the platform, definitely continue these conversations and um, just as an outlet for people to be inspired, man. Like, I, I definitely believe that um, one of the true beauties of, of the resistance movement is hope, right? Like, when no matter what, like, our people don't give up hope. Our people are, are resilient. So I think that if we can provide hope, if we can provide inspiration for future generations and for people around us, then we're doing a, a, a great job at motivating people to, to change, right? And if, if we aren't um, present, right, if we, if we didn't have these two platforms about RJ, there'd be a lot of people that aren't learning what they're learning. So I think it's super important that we're, we're noticeable, that we're present, that people see that, look, there are two people of color here present, talking about this, doing the work, committed to it, um, and, and that's important. And if there's more people out there, then definitely let's, you know, invite them into the conversations because the more people are doing this work, the better it's going to get for future generations to come. Yeah, I think that's one of the really cool things that's come out of the workshops that uh, we've run through the Amplifier J platform, which we will be collaborating on one. Um, we'll share the details of that in the show notes uh, coming up really soon. We hadn't talked about it at the time, but it's December 30 from 9 to 11 a.m. Pacific. But, you know... The beauty of digital space right now is yesterday I was on a call with somebody from Houston, from the Bay, uh, from somewhere else in Southern California, but from Boston and like the Pacific Northwest, like all like this wasn't even a workshop. This is like because of the relationships we built in the workshop, and, like we're all just coming together to reflect on like the end of the year together and like those relationships that you find of people who are doing similar work to you. Um, help you continue the work in places where you may feel like you're the only one doing it. Um, I know that like that's the I know the majority of the audience, probably yours as well. The majority of the Amplify RJ audience is like in the greater Los Angeles area, the greater New York area, Chicago, the Bay, mm -hmm. like these these urban centers where this work is gaining has gained a lot of traction and a lot of popularity. But we also have people from Indiana, from Kansas, from, you know, other places that... Um, Idaho, even, even Idaho. Yeah, yeah, Idaho. Uh, and, like, of course, people, like, in different countries as well, right? But, like, mm -hmm. this work is resonating with people all over, and it's really been a privilege to get to know some of those people and, like, see the impact that... Um, you know, the work that both you and I have done, building on the work that our ancestors and our teachers have done right. um, is, is really getting to spread. Um, in your own life, how does restorative justice practices, philosophies uh, show up, maybe at home with your family or with friends? Yeah, it's just about being a better person overall, um, reflecting on being patient, reflection on being compassionate, on understanding um, my experiences aren't other people's experiences and, and how do I show compassion to people that may need support. In terms of relationships, just, just being a loving individual, trying to be a loving individual and you know letting people know that I appreciate their time. I think that one of the hardest things with everything going on is not being able to spend time with family and, and friends. And I think that that's... Um, 
that's that's also one of the, the the roots of RJ, right? That love to be able to just share time with people. Um, you know, you, we sit in circles when we do this work, right? Um, that's the same way we sat when I was growing up you know, as a little kid, and all my uncles and aunts were sitting, or cousins. We sit in a circle and you're just talking, telling stories, and laughing. So for me, it's like our ancestors have shown us how to live this lifestyle, right? It's really a, how do we get back to it? How do I restore my humanity? Right. And, and remove myself from these ideas of greed and, and feeling the need to want more. So there's definitely that idea of how do I restore something that I, I feel we've we've lost. Right. Um, and and you know, that goes. Everybody has their own individual journey to go through. But for me, it's like that idea of just being a better person, man, like just holding the door for somebody, you know, or. Just somebody hits you up and says, hey, um, I, need, I need a favor and just being like, just being present for them, right? So I think that that's one of the, the main things from my personal life, uh, just understanding what does the next person um, need, right? And how do I give back to the community? How do I go about um, connecting with organizations that are doing amazing things and how I can support? I, I connected with a few organizations for the holidays where we donated over um, 300 toys, um, to the Queens Hospital in New York. So that was an amazing thing. And then um, supporting one of my friends who in college, him and I, we actually started a, um, we rebuilt a school that had damage in Peru because it was an earthquake. We had rebuilt it. And every year we're constantly donating. Um, you know, last year we donated a, a laptop a computer room. And this year we donated food because that's what the, the priority right now with everything going on. So it's like giving back to our communities, man, thinking about areas of like, where can I support people? How can we um, build community overall, right? Because community could be in your household, community could be in your actual, you know, where, where you live, community could be the world. So it's, it's really about just finding those areas and what can I do? Yeah. How do you take care of yourself as you balance all of these things? Yeah, man. I mean, um, I love to sleep. And a lot of people make fun of me because of that. Because like, how do you sleep with everything you do? How do you sleep? And I was like, I don't know. I find ways to sleep. I love to sleep. Um, I love to sleep a lot, actually. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things to do. I just sleep till. How many hours know. a night? Or how many hours a day? I, I mean, I, 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 wake, I, there. I wake up. I mean, I wake up. But, you know, I, let's say let's, my naps go for two, three hours, man. My naps are not naps like they, they say on WebMD. My naps are definitely three hours and then I'm like, oh man, it's seven o'clock. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to go to bed at 11. Um, yeah, I enjoy that. But I, I also enjoy, um, you know, just also playing video games, playing basketball, 2K, uh, watching shows, just hanging out when I could hang out with friends, talking to friends, joking around. I'm a big jokester. A lot of people don't see that um, on the, the social media. I mean, if they follow my personal one, they probably see a little bit. I like to joke around, just, just have fun a little bit. Um, Life is short, so you got to definitely enjoy it. But, yeah, I, I feel like just laughing, man, just being able to put on a comedy show, just relax, laugh a little bit. Because, you know, we know that things are, are hard, but there's joy. There's joy in the struggle, man. Like, I, I tell people, I wouldn't have it any other way. Like, I, I think that there's beauty in the struggle. There's joy in that struggle. And we're just going to continue it, man, until it changes. But I know that that ain't going to be in my generation. I know it's going to be in the in future generations, but I'm going I'm to do my part. I think that, that that's what brings me like that satisfaction of just like enjoying the moments. Just enjoy the moments. Absolutely. Um, moving into the like, they're supposed to be rapid fire questions, but they generally don't end up being rapid fire. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you've kind of already given the answer to this question, but um, define restorative justice in your own words. Hey, restorative justice is a philosophy. Uh, really focused on restoring the hu humanity within us, right? Bring people together, that that universal and humanly bond. Yeah. What is one place or situation where you wish people really knew this work? And like, you're probably going to say schools or the family. So I'm actually going to give you an answer and you're going to have to justify it. Um, in the NBA, where does restorative justice fit in? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it fits in with ownership, right? And that dynamics of ownership and players, um, I don't feel like enough was done in regards to the ownerships taking a stand with everything happening. I felt the players were the ones that really um, set a tone in, in, in the movement. So I feel like owners really have to be brought into that conversation, right? Of like, well, where are you putting your money where your mouth is, right? 
because you profit off of black bodies, right? Black people. They're profiting off of LeBron James and all these individuals, and they're predominantly all white men. So when we think about that dynamic, there's definitely conversations that need to happen there where you're building a, a sense of, um, you know, relationship, right? And that's why you get a lot of players that don't want to play for a team. They're like, trade me. I don't want to play for you no more because they understand who the, who the owner is. And um, so I think that within the NBA context, bringing in those, those um, bringing in owners, bringing in media, bringing in a lot of the people that profit off of these individuals to hear their stories, right? Because one of the things that I'm, I'm always hearing and it's frustrating is like, you know, a, a, a white person may say, well, LeBron James is a millionaire. What does he know? He doesn't, he doesn't struggle. He's still a black man. He's still a black man at the end of the day. Also, Those do you know where LeBron James came from? <laughs> Exactly. Right. Homeless. Right. So it's like I, I, I hate when I hear people try to say that just because an individual is, uh, you know, has money that certain areas of oppression don't impact them or impact their community or don't feel some kind of attachment to the place where they grew up, to the people that they were, grew up with. So I think that those are conversations that have to happen um, for media, for ownership, for anyone involved in who's profiting off of sports in general, um, even the ticket holders, the season ticket holders that are corporations, right, which definitely have to be invited into those conversations to understand, well, why is it that, stu- that uh, players took a knee? Why is it that players are fed up? Because, yes, they're millionaires, but they're still black. They still have connections with their communities. They're still impacted by oppressive systems. And that's something that if, if individuals are doing the work, understanding oppression, then they'll understand that, yes, okay, so-and-so may have the privilege of being a millionaire. However, there are still oppressive barriers that impact so-and-so because the problem is they don't understand intersectionality, right? Um, and I, I read a book by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar um, in the, like the beginning of last year, and he was protesting at UCLA. Uh, I think it was like, it was some, some incident that occurred and he was protesting with students. He was, he was like, I think his first few years um, as a player. And someone had said that to him as well. Like, oh, what are you doing protesting? Like, you're not even impacted by that. And he said, he's like, well, I am. And I'm here. So what's it to you? Because you're not contributing to this conversation. So what are you talking to me for? And I thought that was super powerful, right? It's like, you're not even contributing to the work. So who are you to tell him not to be there? Who are you to tell someone to shut up and dribble, right? As um, a news anchor told LeBron James, who are you when you're not contributing? And they are. And they're actually impacted by it. So, yeah, the, the RJ conversations, there's a lot to, to hold there and invite media and everybody who's profiting off of these basketball players, man. By the way, shout out to the Brooklyn Nets, man. KD, uh, Kyrie. Uh, it's looking amazing for us this year. I don't want to jinx it, but, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful for the Brooklyn Nets. <laughs> oh, man. I, I'm curious, like, yeah, there's there's accountability from ownership for sure that needs to take place, and like the other parties that profit. I'm curious, like what you think an equitable structure could look like, because like in my mind that probably doesn't mean like ownership by the owners as it's constructed, and it's like a lot more like worker driven, right? And workers just aren't like the players, right? Workers are like the people who. Um, like our our team staff and uh, arena staff and like all these things and it's just like this radical reimagination of what you know professional sports can be and then I think like with that we probably do lose some of the like I will say like deification of like some of these players the LeBrons the Kevin Durant's the Stephs the all of this right Um, but I think that it's better for young people to look up and say like, Hey, this person is like a worker in this, like this is their job, but they're also like contributing to like the collective uh, community um, of, you know, this company that is like the golden state warriors that employs like, you know, hundreds of people, not just like the 15 Mm -hmm. people running around on the court. Um, And then like this company that, you know, benefits from like all the Silicon Valley money, like also shares profits with, um, all the other teams in the league and not just like for the owner's sake, but for like the every, everybody else who participates, like there's, there's so much that could happen within that. 
and endless endless conversations, endless possibilities, man. See, I told you this was not going to be rapid fire. Um, <laughs> you get to sit in circle with four people, dead or alive. Who are they, and what do you talk about? Oh man, that's a good one. Um, well, I've mentioned him a few times. I, I would say uh, James Baldwin, Malcolm X, Jose Marti, and Che Guevara. I would do those four. Um, what would you talk about? Man, we would just talk about what they believe a society should look like, what they believe, um, you know, is the overall purpose of, of, of living, what do they believe um, are some of the steps that we have to take as a, as a whole to change our communities, to better our communities, talk policies, talk about policies that empower. I mean, I, I think that just reading their work, I mean, so much to digest, man. It would be an honor <laughs> to just be in that room with, with the four of them. But it would just be so much questions about, like, what, what, what were some of their mistakes? What were some things that they would redo? Where were some areas that they would want to grow so that I could learn, you know, where to, where to move towards, what to do, and how to also inspire other people to, do, to learn from their mistakes? So, yeah, it'd be, it'd be a lot of questions for them, and I, I have a whole... Field day and also just listening, just listening to what they have to say, right? Because I think that people in general, whether it's the four of them or anybody, they have so much stories, like I was mentioning earlier, and they have so much things that they want to share. And I think that we could take away so much from just sitting down and just sometimes just hearing people out, right? And, and interpreting, like, how does that, uh, how does that, how do the words that they said impact me, motivate me, make me a better individual? And then going out into the world and putting that positivity right back that they, you know, bestowed upon me. So I think that that's, that's super important, whether it's the four of them or anybody that I'm talking to, any positive light that they can, you know, spread. How do I reflect that light to other individuals as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what's one thing you wish everyone listening in this podcast would know? Um, examine, examine. Uh, privilege, examine systems of oppression, understand how they show up in your life, understand how they show up if you're an educator in the classroom, understand how they show up in the workplace, um, think about policies, think about structures that continue that, um, that status quo of oppression, right, uh, of not allowing opportunity, and then think about how you want to change that, no matter what that is, because we all play a role, whether that's the teacher in, you know, Florida or the whoever, you know, whoever it is that in another place, a basketball player in Los Angeles. Right. So we all play a role and no role is, is too big, too small, because in, in unison and unity, the, the the their strength. So I think that when we're all playing our part, when we're all doing this work, there is no one sole, per, sole person that's going to bring this change. It's going to be a group of people. So I think that um, if we're all reflecting in unison, We'll, we'll continue to make the world a better place. It, it just comes back to like the relationships between you and yourself and your community. And, and yeah. that's it. That's the, that's um, the main philosophy. That's, that's RJ, right? Like that's, that's <laughs> our work. That's our work. And, and we're continuously doing that ourselves. So um, if people want to learn it, they need to understand that that's part of it. Yeah, for sure. Um, who is one person that I should have on this podcast? And before you answer, you have to help me get them on. <laughs> like realistically? Because this, this, this is outside of like, I don't even know if you would think that, but um, Will Smith. And, I, and I'll explain why Will Smith, as crazy right. as that sounds. I feel um, Will Smith has, and I was watching one of his like table talk shows, mm -hmm. and um, he was doing some work with a therapist. Maybe we can get the therapist. I don't remember her name, but... She, um, they, they, they were just allowing the trauma that he's gone through, the hurt that he's caused um, on Viv, right? And I, and it's for like when I was watching that show, it definitely reminded me of the work that I do with students all the time, of acknowledging your traumas, and then also the hurt that you project on others. But I know I mean, Will Smith would probably be a little difficult to get. But um, I mean, there's so many um, great. Um, RJ Advocates, I mean, there's um, there's um, Ada Pecos uh, Melton. She's um, she's one of the directors of the American um, 
the American Indian uh, Develop Association. So I think she's great. She's said some amazing things. that's super connected to the um, indigenous culture as well. Um, there's uh, I got some books here as well, too, that I, um, I'm always uh, looking at. So I got the Restorative Circles in Schools, Bob Costello and Joshua Watchtell. They're pretty good as well. And definitely a lot of reflection on like being present and being there for students and, and, and understanding like who our students are and that relationship dynamic. And they do a pretty good job there, man. So there's, there's a, a whole list of, of individuals that do amazing work in, in the RJ world. I think that's the coolest thing. Like it's constant learning. Yeah, for sure. Um, you get them and then, you know, Will Smith. I think like for me, like one of my dreams with Amplifier RJ is to be talking about this on Trevor Noah's show. So, I mean, I, that's a little bit of a raw reversal, but I'm thinking about how, you know, um, especially coming, being a biracial person from South Africa, so South Africa, like during and then after apartheid, like the truth and reconciliation um, that that country went through, like, I just think there's like a natural fit. So shout out yeah. Trevor Noah, if you're listening Trevor to Noah. anybody related to that show, track, Will track, people. Yeah, tag, uh, tag Will Smith and Trevor Noah in the comments, people. <laughs> Make it happen. Support us. We'll make it happen. Um, and finally, how can people support you and your work in the ways that you want to be supported? Yeah, um, definitely uh, the work that I'm uh, putting out in terms of you know my writings, definitely check it out. Hit me up, engage in conversations. I've had many people do that. I love to have those conversations. Uh, if, if people want to just you know check out some of the work that I'm, content that I've been producing on the Restoring Racial Justice platform, check that out. I've also done a video with four educators from around the country, New York, Texas, um, Georgia, and Colorado. And we talk a little bit about racial equity there. So those are all things that people can find on my website, which is Jorge uh, Santos.info. You can also Google um, my name and teacher or educator. I should pop up, I think. But yeah, I mean, just definitely, uh, I'm trying to put out work to inspire people and to, to change the system. So I would definitely appreciate people checking it out and uh, connecting. I would definitely appreciate that. And if, you know, people want to have, uh, invite me to their schools, that'd be great, man. I would love to inspire schools to start this work. Well, you heard the man. So many ways to get connected, so many ways to plug in, so many ways to support. I want to thank you, Jorge, for the time that you've given, the wisdom that you've shared. Um, anything else you want to say? Um, David, man, I just want to say thank you, man, for providing this space because I've seen the, the growth. Um, it's amazing, man, the work that you are doing. Um, the commitment that you have to RJ is an amazing thing. Um, it's much needed. It's much needed. And I think that this time is super important for all this to happen. So, I mean, I just want to say thank you, man. And you're an inspiration to me. Um, seeing the work you're doing, man, it just motivates me as well to um, to continue the work I'm doing, man. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Well, thank you. I'm really looking forward to continuing to be in a relationship even after this recording ends. So for everybody else, um, thank you so much for listening. We'll talk to you next week. Like what you heard? Please subscribe, rate, review, and share this podcast on whatever platform you're using right now. It really helps us further amplify this work. You can also support us by following us on our social platforms, signing up for our email list, rocking our new merch, joining our Patreon, or signing up for a workshop. So many options! Links to everything in the show notes and on our website, AmplifyRJ.com. Thanks so much for listening. We'll talk to you next week.